Thank you, Bupa. There's a great thing about history, right? <laughs> it gets modified, changed, adapted, improved. And I think that being a, a rabble rouser when I was here last is definitely an improvement to what I remember. <laughs> um, I've got to say, first of all, that you know I'm a bit overwhelmed. This day of presentations and talks has actually been unlike most other events around the nuclear condition that I've ever been to. And um, I think the extent of emotional distance that I've traveled in terms of whether it was just being overwhelmed by hearing some of the presentations that we have had, but also by the humor that was expressed at moments, um, has really sent me on a kind of a all over the place. So um, I'm going to move from, I think, those very high moments to perhaps more prosaic and more uh, everyday forms of discussion about the nuclear question. And in particular, what I'm going to be thinking about our movements. And we began this conversation yesterday evening with a discussion about the TPNW. Uh, today, we're going to uh, I'm going to talk about the quest of movements as they lead into the future. And I'm going to do it in a way that's perhaps more personal, because I've been part of these ideas and discussions and attempts to mobilize for many, many years now. And so I want to begin my remarks by thinking about a workshop that I went to last year. Last year was the 25th year since India and Pakistan um, set off a set of nuclear tests and declared themselves as nuclear weapon states. Um, and that was an important gathering because, well, perhaps it was a depressing gathering in some ways because it had been 25 years since the tests had taken place. And we were not sure what to make of what had happened since. And present at the meeting were a group of people like myself, people of, I'm going to call them the, the old generation, because that's clearly what we are. Uh, and then the generation of people who are just coming out of PhDs, who are doing young, who are in their first few job, first job, their postdocs, things like that. And over the course of two days, what became very, very clear is that we were talking entirely different languages. Um, the people, my generation, people were all thinking about nuclear weapons. We were thinking about international peace. We were thinking about links to the TPNW and to other movements which operate at the global and regional levels. The young people were all talking about nuclear power, not nuclear weapons, nuclear energy stations. They were looking at mobilizing against nuclear power in different parts of the country. They were talking about justice. They were talking about reparations. They were talking about dignity. And we're, you know, the language was different. The context was different. The scale was different. The methods were different. Right? And it took me a long time to understand what was happening. My first reaction was actually a very disappointing one when I think back on it, because I, had, I said to myself, oh my God, what that means is that deterrence has worked. Because only if deterrence works could activists, scholars, people interested who are deeply concerned about the nuclear conditions in South Asia, that's the only way they could ignore what's taking place over the last 25 years. They can afford to look at local events and local actions and local movements because they don't have to worry about interstate war between India and Pakistan. And that was very depressing. And so I've, started, I've kept on thinking about it because I'm not happy with that conclusion. And I've tried to come to some tentative conclusions about how to think about what I understood or what I encountered at that meeting. Uh, and that's what I want to share with you. So this is very much work in progress. Um, and I think it's very, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have taken this opportunity if it had not been for Karen and for Neville and for Cooper and for all the other people who have put this together. So thanks for your labor, thanks for your infrastructure, thanks for all the work that you've done. Uh, and in that spirit, I want to just go ahead and lay out some of my ideas at this point. Uh, and really, I'm looking for feedback, for comments, for thoughts. Uh, and um, because I think, you know, the future is, is too important to be left to political science, so we say, or international. <laughs> Um, I want to start by just making a couple of explanatory kind of comments in terms of some terms I'm going to use. When I say nuclear power, I mean both nuclear uh, civilian and military projects. I mean both nuclear weapons and nuclear uh, energy. Uh, when I say civil society, I want to distinguish that from atomic publics, which is perhaps a clumsy term, but a term that I use to describe the populations that are interpolated by, political, by, uh, by nuclear power. So civil society is an elite formation in places like South Asia, 
It doesn't include everybody in the way that we often say civil society as contrast with the state. Um, atomic publics, on the other hand, are discrete objects, discrete entities, discrete formations that uh, come about due to their relation to or encounter with nuclear power in one of its many forms. So let me begin by talking about the current state of affairs. And I'm warning you in advance, it's pretty depressing. Nuclear power in South Asia is well institutionalized, both weapons and energy. Elite civil society considers it in both India and Pakistan to be part of their national identity. Movements against nuclear energy in both countries have largely disappeared at the national scale. There is now, I would call something like a stable disequilibrium between the two nuclear weapon states in South Asia. But at the same time, when we use the word South Asia, it's changed radically from 25 years ago. South Asia now includes China, which is another nuclear weapon state, of course. Bangladesh is now building nuclear power stations. And at the same time, the Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, the so-called smaller states of the region, have all signed the TPNW. And that's an important state. New nuclear power stations are being built in India at a regular basis. There are now 22 plants with plans for another six or seven. Uh, every plant has gone over budget. Every plant takes 10 more years than it should be to actually come about, but that's normal now. But most important, really, what I want to say is that there's no longer a national movement against nuclear energy or nuclear power. There are localized resistances at multiple new and proposed stage, uh, locations in different regions of the country. And that's what I want to come back So what I want to suggest is that rather than seeing a kind of a linear progression from 1998, when India and Pakistan became nuclear weapon states, to the present, 2024, I want to suggest that actually there are two, we should really be thinking about two genealogies of anti-nuclear resistance in South Asia, which are quite distinct and which begin from different places. The moment might be similar, meaning around the same time, I would say the period between 1974 and 1984, but the form that they've taken are quite distinct. I've already told you what they are. One is a peace genealogy, and it takes as its critical historical moments the 1974 nuclear tests and the 1998 nuclear tests and the responses to those in, uh, in particular. The second genealogy I'm going to call the justice one. First is peace, the second is justice. And it takes the Bhopal industrial accident of 1984, combined with Chernobyl two years later as one moment, and the Fukushima accident of 2011 as its second. So I'm not trying to suggest that there is really a divergence in generational terms. Uh, as it appeared at first glance at this workshop last year. What I'm really trying to say is that when we talk about an anti-nuclear movement in South Asia, we have always had to at least two genealogies, one more concerned with peace, one more concerned with justice. And it's just that at this moment, they have become their differences, their divergences have become much more clear and much more uh, apparent. So I'm going to... Uh, do I press one? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. So okay, give me a chance. Oh. So, in a very social sciencey way, which is where I come from, um, I try to break this down in terms of what these divergences and differences are. I'm not actually going to dwell on them. I'm going to leave them on the screen for you to look at. And there's two of them. So let me just outline what the different criteria are, and then I want to get to conclusions, because it's been a long day for all of us, right? And I want to get to the end of the matter before we go back to why I think what it is. So very quickly, the problematic is about, in the peace genome, it's about nuclear weapons. In the other one, it's on nuclear power stations, um, and the rest of it follows. Um, distrust of nuclear, but the question of the state is quite critical in all these stories, and we have very different visions of the state in those two uh, aspects. In particular, uh, when we think about this, oh, see that, I mean, as usual, I can't make up my mind what I'm going to say. Uh, the third is the question of scale, and I think here we have to think about a national scale, a regional scale, and a global scale, where the atomic public is being produced at different levels, at different scales. Uh, in the justice genealogy, the atomic public is locally defined, um, and the issue is disconnected with peace movements, affiliated with other social movements against development projects, and you can see where this is going. What I'm getting at here is that the justice movements, the more contemporary movements, are post-development. 
they are more concerned about land. They're more concerned about justice in the locality. They see the state as not having had, not offering any opportunities for them anymore. There's no point in using law or turning to the state for, for reparations because it's already shown its cards as being a state that doesn't particularly care about people. Um, the movement discourses are radically different in both cases. And I think here we may want to reflect on the first one in particular for a few minutes because we've been talking about movements um, and um, questions of fear and insecurity versus questions of justice and environment and land and intergenerational toxicity. Uh, the model of the movement in South Asia it used to be a kind of classic movement that anyone who worked on Europe would immediately appreciate. Uh, and that was very much, I think, the model in people's minds without necessarily always saying it. In the, in the case of the justice genealogy, it's localized, it's different. It's not aligned with other peace movements, it's aligned with other indigenous caste and other movements. Uh, and finally, political alliances in terms of in South Asia, in India, sorry, not South Asia. Uh, the question of relationship to political parties is quite crucial. Uh, the justice movements don't have those connections at all. Okay, I'll leave this one up. All right, I've got a few minutes left in which I want to just run through some of my conclusions. One, if we had more time, I would have talked about the exceptions to these cases, and one in West Bengal, one in Kerala. Uh, we can save that for later or when the longer version of this comes out, as I hope it will at some point. So what then? How do we contrast? How do we think about? What do we draw from this comparison? I want to suggest, first of all, that it, it uh, re reflects the movement from a peace genealogy to a justice one reflects a vastly changed environment. No, no, no big you know, insight there. Um, the justice movement reflects what you might call a democratic deficit in India more generally. And the striking aspects of difference are as follows. The atomic public is defined locally, not nationally. The uniqueness and singularity of the nuclear condition has been reduced. And this is really important because Critical nuclear studies has always said we can't treat the nuclear condition as this unique, special, wonderful thing or horrible thing in the way that people who work in traditional mainstream areas have been telling us. We've got to break down the boundaries that separate the nuclear world from everything else. And that's what a lot of critical work has been doing. This justice genealogy, I think, does that very, it begins from that premise. Uh, that's why I call them post development. Um, so the anti-nuclear justice movements are now framed as expressions of development failures and top-down intervention. Uh, like other struggles, the acquisition of land becomes the major fault line that generates local resistance. Other fault lines that need to be mentioned are the fluidity of internal fractures within this atomic public, including landless and landed, high caste and anti-caste, settler indigenous, all have ever emerged variously in different moments as axes of resistance. There is a complete decline in the trust of scientific expertise and a rise in overt police repression. And that's a longer story that we can talk about when these projects were initiated. Uh, it used to be the case that scientists would be the ones to go out there and say, why, this is such a wonderful idea. Now they don't even bother. In fact, what you get is the police or the armed forces going in there to shut down repression before it begins. Um, from the state standpoint, any resistance to nuclear power continues to be cast as anti-national but only more so. And legal re recourse, which has always been weak in the South Asian context, is even less effective than before. The boundaries between international, national, and local scales have shifted substantially since 1998. Connections to international spaces of resistance are weak or absent. Connections to other local and regional anti-nuclear movements are weak or absent. Connections to other justice or post-development movements are much stronger. Learning from others' experience, including the past, is limited. And there's a complete loss of faith in the power, the value of protest to change national policies. At best, you can do something locally, not at the national level. Trust and sacrifice as tropes of national discourse, which used to be preeminent in the earlier period, no longer are considered are valid. Uh, expectations in terms of what the state can and will provide have changed radically. A transactional relationship between public and the state is now normalized. So the question of citizenship has fundamentally changed in this process. And these movements reflect that substantially. Uh, and I would say that if in the past there was a tendency in the larger sense to think about outright rejection of nuclear power, 
I would say now in this justice framework, there's actually something that we could better term reluctant accommodation. In other words, don't do it here, do it somewhere else. I'm going to stop it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Eddie. We're going to move right along to our next speaker this afternoon in this panel. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Vanya Hamzic, who is a reader in law, history, and anthropology at SOAS University of London. Uh, Hamzic's legal, anthropological, and historical research addresses issues in human subjectivity formation, especially those related to gender, sexual, class, race, linguistic, and religious difference with the principal fieldwork sites uh, in Pakistan, Indonesia, Senegal, and Louisiana. So uh, a, great, uh, a great assortment of ge generations and genealogies there. So I'm excited to welcome Vanya to the stage. Thanks so much, Cooper, for that very generous <laughs> introduction. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, team. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, Neville. It's such a pleasure, such a privilege to be here. It's a harrowing moment in which we are right now. So many forms of genocidal violence around us, so many forms of violence. Full stop. Uh, difficult to account for, difficult to, to figure out the way to respond, but I think, and I think it for quite a while now, I guess, coming from Sarajevo, from Bosnia. Uh, the only way really is to always rethink peace and rethink uh, feminist and queer response. Uh, and so that would be my perspective here. As uh, Cooper has said, I spent quite some time in Pakistan, and this will be a presentation that uh, repeats in many ways what, what, what Iti has said uh, uh, about the ways in which uh, one recounts the things that have both lost silences, uh, ways of remembering, uh, ways of misremembering, ways of erasure, but at the same time also uh, the new, the new uh, horizons of hope. And uh, I'll be talking from a variety of literatures uh, about Pakistan's own standing with respect to this uh, formations in South Asia of nuclear nationalism and nuclearism. And uh, not so much with respect to that, but is always the other side, so-called, that is India, but rather the kind of larger Muslim world in which Pakistan also claims to have a stake. And so uh, it really is such an enormous honor to be here today and learn from you all. And thank you for all your testimonies and thank you for all your courage. Uh, so uh, as I said, my intervention also considers Cold War South Asia and in the next 15 minutes, hopefully, I'm, I'm trying to sketch out a series of brief situated uh, analytical directions in what might be called a feminist and queer recollection of Pakistan's complex history of its own nuclear program. Uh, what one encounters at the surface, just as Kitty just said, uh, when memories are rejoiced and old stories retold, is a sense of disquietude uh, about opportunities lost, movements stunted in their growth, and of the nuclear voices dissonant, disjoint, and fading in their lonesome tenor. And perhaps this is not unusual for intergenerational peace and justice movements everywhere, but Pakistan's unique standing in and dealings with the wider Muslim world give it a distinct tang. And it is this complex, extraordinary sense of multiple displacement, orientalism, and systemic erasures uh, that uh, I'd like to revisit today. Uh, in hope that some disgruntled silences can one day give way to more capacious processes of re -analyzation. So to do so, I, I will first say just a few words about how Pakistan became the only Muslim-majority country that is a nuclear weapons state, and how this came to be framed as first a prospect and then the rather underwhelming reality of an Islamic bomb. I will then sketch out what I call the politics of scientific dissent, uh, which Pakistani scientists, taking several mutually irreconcilable directions uh, in their dealings with nuclear nationalism and daily real politics, had to grapple with. And this should hopefully provide a useful background to the complex terrain of feminist and peace 
movements, disquietudes, which, as I argue, should be examined against what certainly feels like a protracted, unending regional Cold War in all but name. And in the end, I will offer some thoughts on what makes such a, such a war possible by asking what gets cooled or frozen in South Asia's cis-heteropatriarchal nationalist nuclear politics. So Pakistan's now conventional history of the bomb recounted in the subgen subcontinental academic and popular press and beyond reads not unlike your standard Cold War novel. Uh, there are not so secretive, secret meetings such as that of 20th of January of 1972 in Multan, where Zulfikar Ali uh, just one month after assuming the pres Pakistani presidency gathered Pakistani scientists with local politicians and selected members of his press corps in attendance. And now, bluntly, as had been his attempt for quite some time, quote, how long will it take you to make a nuclear bomb? And in response, apparently, young scientists were trying to outfit each other as uh, though at an auction. And Bhutto gave them the deadline, uh, I want the bomb in three years. And there are also epic arch rivalries uh, involving inviting uh, inevitable popular comparisons, such as that between the two Khans, that is, Dr. Munir Ahmed Khan, a talented nuclear uh, reactor physicist whom Bhutto uh, placed at the helm of the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, PIKE, uh, and the flamboyant Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan, a metallurgical engineer whose clandestine operations had perhaps contradictorily uh, his love for the media spotlight earned him the status of a national hero who headed a separate research and uranium enrichment facility in Kahuta soon renamed in his honor as the Khan Research Laboratories, or uh, KRL. So Munir Ahmed Khan was uh, nicknamed uh, Reactor Khan, uh, <laughs> and popularly described as speaking in code and in whispers, while uh, A.Q. Khan, as he was known, was extolled as the Muslim Oppenheimer, and, quote, a cross between Dr. Strangelove and Isl an Islamic James Bond, end quote. <laughs> And there's also taxism aplenty, as in the prominent journalist Shahidur Rahman's Tell-All, in which he recounts, for example, how the theoretical physicist Abdul Salam uh, asked a blushing peg scientist to design a nuclear device that resembled explosive breasts of a woman, or how Pakistani leadership's reluctance to accept uh, American aid was like a, quote, ravishing beauty who first hesitates to provide their services, but is inevitably persuaded when offering a much larger sum. I'm writing, I'm, I'm reading from a popular literature, but I'm reading also from literature that does not happen to be so popular in terms of its own out academic uh, outputs and currency. And there's appreciation for modernist architecture uh, exuding a distinct South Asian Muslim player, uh, as with the Pakistan uh, Institute of Nuclear Science and Technology, the PINSTEC, designed by the American architect Edward uh, Durrell Stone and described as potentially the most architecturally stunning physics complex in the world. And of course, there's the occasional cameo of uh, Henry Kissinger, whom Bhutto describes as uh, an cool bully who needed reminding that he was addressing, quote, the head of an elected government in the country. What's certain, however, is that the history of the bomb in Pakistan complicates the usual way the distinction between its democratically elected governments and military dictatorships are painted uh, with allegiances that are murky and changing precisely because of the symbolic power of such a weapon. Uh, Pakistan's quest for the bomb began in earnest under Bhutto, a democratically elected, ostensibly Muslim socialist leader, famed for his progressive agenda. It continued after his demise under the military dictator Zia al uh, with both Hayek and uh, KRL, succeeding in developing a deliverable nuclear weapon independently of each other and roughly at the same time, that is uh, in March 1983 and December 1984, apparently, respectively. And it uh, finally reached a public demonstration of this pursuit under another civilian leader, Nawaz Sharif, when in the wake of the Indian nuclear test earlier that month, uh, six nuclear devices were set off under the Raskwal Hills in the Shagai district of Balochistan on 28th and the 30th of, uh, 30th of May of 1998. And so while the style of government and its domestic outcomes varied considerably between different Pakistani political and military elites, they all supported Pakistan's road to nuclearization and engaged in multiple forms of highly effective 
nuclear nationalism. And especially after Bhutto, the army's role in these dangerous machinations remained central throughout. So scientists, feminists, and peace activists alike uh, found this complex nuclear political terrain exceptionally difficult to navigate, not least because a great deal of a Pakistan's atomic public, uh, to use uh, Iti Abraham's helpful critical term of art, came to love the bomb, especially given its alleged so-called Islamic character. Uh, years before uh, any public demonstration of the bomb or even its clandestine designs, the foreign and domestic press and the analysts of a wide range of political persuasions warned that Pakistan was building, quote, an Islamic bomb. And in an oft-quoted passage, Bhutto himself uh, lamented that, quote, the Christian, Jewish, and Hindu civilizations have this capacity, capability and that only the Islamic civilization was without it adding conspicuously, but that position was about to change. Uh, but the project, as far as Bhutto was concerned, uh, was spun as an Islamic bomb primarily as to motivate, motivate scientists and generate requisite funds from wealthy Muslim states. If Libya under Muammar al-Qaddafi, uh, Bhutto's political uh, ally and confidant, uh, was to acquire the bomb through Pakistan's assistance, as it was apparently originally conceived, that bomb, would have been perhaps as Islamic as Pakistan's in that Islam uh, and the vision of pan-Muslim unity were important tools in these leaders' political toolbox, albeit hardly something far more significant than that. And for all his conservative posturing and projects saying that the Islamization of law, education, and public policy, the military dic the dictator Zia al uh, refrained from publicly boasting about the country's still clandestine nuclear weapon cap capabilities, not least because his deep ties with the United States. However, the discourse on an Islamic bomb was soon appropriated by a wide range of conservative religious parties in Pakistan, exploding into numerous acts of public commemoration and defiance in the aftermath of the 1998 nuclear tests, which left a spate of curious artifacts behind, including gaudy, colorful models of Pakistan's nuclear missiles at the Chagai Mountains, adorning public crossroads and, and squares for years to come. Elsewhere in the Muslim world, prominent clerics of such as Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and Egypt's Grand Mufti uh, Ali Gumma uh, have issued fatawa or Islamic legal opinions against weapons of mass destruction. In Pakistan, however, conservative cler clerics insisted that the bomb was a matter of national security and Muslim pride. When in early 2004, it was revealed that Dr. A. Q. Khan sold through his clandestine international proliferation network nuclear know-how and materials to Iran, Libya, and North Korea, uh, public protests and strikes uh, erupted in his support. Uh, An ultra-conservative preacher retorted, quote, he shared the technology for the supremacy of Islam, and he acted on God's command. Apparently, North Korea is included in this Muslim world, according to this preacher. Uh, Pakistani scientists engaged in the peculiar politics of scientific dissent. A few, like Dr. A.Q. Khan, sought to further, ver uh, further ver various would-be pan-Muslim causes uh, to even journeying several times into Afghanistan in 2000 to the, for meetings with the Taliban. And the majority preferred a form of silent dissent uh, con concerning themselves primarily with matters of scientific research and education, or were persuaded by the dominant form of nuclear nationalism. But a group of dedicated peace activists has also emerged from the Pakistani scientific community, foremost of whom are the nuclear physicist Pervez Hudbai, uh, Abdul Hamid Nayar uh, and Ziyan Yar. And the trio uh, uh, has published together and separately a great deal of books and articles in which they cogently argue against Pakistan's brand of nuclearism and advocate for a range of peaceful, economically sensible steps towards dis disarmament and abolition. As self avowed scientists who reject nuclear patriotism, they're often the target of state and non state actors who see Pakistan's security permanently tied to its nuclear weapon cap capabilities. Their analysis, delivered in clear, fact centered prose, defies disciplinary boundaries and aims at debunking various commonly cherished myths about Pakistan's nuclear nationalism. Memorable is, for, for example, Pervez Hudbai's uh, recollection of a meeting with a Pakistani general unmoved by the lethality of nuclear war. You can die crossing the streets, Riley observed the general, or you could die in a nuclear war. You've got to die someday anyway. And so the wider Pakistani feminist and peace justice movement share these 
sobering account with the cynical majority. Activists recalled on multiple occasions how lonely and helpless they had felt at times when the deathly real politic of Pakistan-Indian relations threatened to throttle any form of dialogue or dissent. <laughs> Their near erasure from the popular histories of social movements in Pakistan had had a similar effect. Feminist histories in particular, centered as they are on the role of the Women's Action Forum, WAF, at the Louvre Umbrella Collective for Women's Rights since the early 1980s, often refrained from recounting its early solidarity and peace action for the fear of depicting it as too broad and in some cases as too political. Yet in the early years, uh, Waf, quote, raised the voice not only for women's rights, but also against military dictatorship and for a demand for the restoration of democracy. Operating as a non-hierarchical platform, it refused to accept any external funding or open permanent office. Instead, it engaged in direct action against the oppressive state, which saw its members arrested and threatened, as well as baton charged and tear gas by the police. Uh, Left-leaning women's collectives operated both within and without it, such as a Lahore-based uh, public team, uh, which tried, quote, to pulling uh, further to the left, or the Applied Social Research Resource Center, one of the vocal socialist feminist fora. Uh, also of note is a Marxist collective known as the Democratic Women's Organization, DWO, who raised issues of, of equal wages for, for, for equal work or transport services and basic facilities for workers and issues of non-militarization and peace. The, w, the DWO and other similar groups are however rarely described as feminist or indeed as pacifist. It is however now commonly understood that the peace movement including its various feminist trends gained considerable urgency and broadened its base in the aftermath of the 1998 nuclear attack and the 1999 Kargil Kargi conflict the latter first involved now in nuclear Pakistan and India at the opposing sides. Uh, out of many cross-border peace actions that ensued, memorable uh, is the episode of the first peace bus, which one keen observer described as follows. A women's peace bus involving several women's groups came to Pakistan, spearheaded by the veteran Gandhi and Nirmala Deshpande, and Pakistan's women led by Asma Jahangir, greeted the busload of Indian women on their arrival in Lahore with flower garlands, music, and glass bangles. And as for the bangles, Asma Jahangir, uh, Lahore's, uh, you know, Pakistan's foremost uh, human rights activist later observed, quote, the exchange bangles, which are traditionally used as symbols of weakness and subverted the negative connotation to positive one by using them as symbols of peace. Yet these movements of triumph and togetherness are rarely remembered more rarely still critically appraised and contextualized. So I'd like to offer in closing some thoughts as to the prevalence of such silence and its resultant disquietudes. I have argued elsewhere that owing to the complexity of many regional relations, not least the, 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 between India and Pakistan, the Cold War in South Asia may have entered a new phase after the fall of the Berlin Wall of 19, November 1989, but it certainly did not end. And after all, multiple constellations of predominantly cold yet constant warfare characterized the global Cold War II. I have argued also that due to its ominous Cold War legacy, Pakistan often relives its own rebellion future past, the constant loop of events and circumstances in which Cold War-like elites prolong indefinitely a peace that is no peace for the sake of their own survival. And similarly, authors across South Asia have observed that the protracted, seemingly indefinite India-Pakistan conflict has been, in the words of Said Afan, frozen and the phase of escalation. What made this high tense stagnation possible is precisely the emergence and declaration of these states as nuclear and with it as staunchly nuclearist and nuclear nationalists. So it is the prerogative of critical decolonial, pacifist, feminist, and queer scholarship to expose this stilted regional Cold War for what it is, a technology of undemocratic and extractive cis-heteropatriarchal governance, whose toxic res residue will be felt years after it is finally consigned to the annals of history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanya. Um, our next speaker is someone who I probably shouldn't have to have a bio printed out for, but here we are. Uh, Karen Engel is Minerva House Drysdale Regents Chair in Law and Founder and Co-Director of the Rappaport Center 
uh, for Human Rights and Justice at the University of Texas at Austin. She's also been an instrumental force behind the Sissy Farenthold Fund for Peace and Social Justice. And she writes on the interaction between social movements and the law, particularly international human rights and humanitarian law. So please help me welcome Karen to the stage. Almost 24 hours. <laughs> see if I can put down my water at the same time as I talk into the microphone. I can't. Um, thank you all so much for all being here. Um, many of you have been here from the beginning yesterday. Um, the conversations have been incredible, and I agree with it. Overwhelming in so many ways, it's hard to imagine kind of even what to say at this point, but fortunately I thought about it a little bit and I have a text. <laughs> um, and also, since I won't get the last word, could we just give a huge, huge, huge applause to Caroline Kahn? <laughs> and Quinn, <laughs> let Cray. <laughs> And a few applauses, um, and you get to have the last word, and everybody will applaud then. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, Caroline and Quinn got them because they've kept us all fed and got you all here, and are going to get you home maybe if we let them. Okay, now don't start my time till now. Uh, so the issue I'd like to pose for you this afternoon is what we, especially but not only, international lawyers might learn from the Cold War women's peace movement, specifically the connections it drew among peace, nuclear disarmament, protection of the environment, and more equitable global development. And hopefully in some ways that Itty didn't think maybe had quite been done. Um, to begin to answer that question, I'll highlight how the movement captured those connections in ways that might help us think intergenerationally to contest today's dominant approaches to international law, because that's the field that I'm sitting in, in which unfortunately peace and nuclear disarmament have largely disappeared as serious policy or legal option, doctrinal options. Relatedly, I'll also challenge the type of feminism that has come to dominate international governance. Though the focus of that feminist, feminism is violence, it's mostly interpersonal violence rather than the interstate violence that animated the feminist movement during the Cold War. In short, I contend that international law and relations in general have much to learn from the recovery of the anti-nuclear movement of the mid to late 1980s, which, as Gary Simpson and Karen Knopp have said in related contexts, has not just been forgotten, but actively unremembered. And I think that resonates uh, a bit maybe with the idea uh, that Hiba gave us from uh, Mahmoud Darwish. The, I was really struck by that memory for forgetfulness um, and went to read the whole, will read the whole poem. So I'll focus most of my remarks on a group, Women for a Meaningful Summit, um, or WMS, which was an ad hoc group of women who came together to have a direct impact on the four Reagan Gorbachev summits between 1985 and 1988. As I mentioned yesterday, Sissy Farenthold and her cousin Genevieve Vaughn served on the board of the organization, <coughs> along with LaDonna Harris, Coretta Scott King, and many others. And much of what I know about it is derived from their papers at UT. Um, and I want to say it's not that those papers just appeared to me. <laughs> um, they took the diligent work of many people, uh, including Francesca Passaseo, who I hope is back. Did she? Yeah, there you are, um, who found all kinds of jewels. And also Maria X. Davila, who um, helped work through those jewels. So though WMS began in the US, it built on established transnational web networks, and so soon included women from around the world, including many from the global south. 
And many of the participants had been involved in other peace activism from Women's Strike for Peace in the 1960s to the 1985 Nairobi Peace Tent and protests at Greenham Common and Comiso. Many were also involved with local and global environmental movements, which they saw as inseparable from the nuclear issue. The WMS promoted treaties for a comprehensive test ban, for the removal of nuclear bases from uh, nuclear weapons from military bases in Europe, which did happen due to the uh, INF treaty that resulted from the summits, and into the US's so called Star Wars program, the ratification of treaties establishing regional nuclear free zones, and the creation of nuclear free zones by local governments. Its work was animated not just by the idea of a potential disaster from nuclear war, but by the multiple ongoing disasters already wrought by the extractive and imperial production, testing, and use of nuclear weapons that we've heard so much about today and yesterday. Now, important for us, I believe, are several aspects of WMS that I'll discuss. So first, its approach to diplomacy as a part of civil society, its use of international law to support regional treaties to abolish nuclear weapons and local government efforts to declare nuclear free zones, and its relatively capacious approach to feminism. And I'll go through each of these quickly and conclude with some reflections about what happened to and might be recoverable from WMS's work. So first, WMS as private or citizen diplomats. As they headed to the first summit in Geneva, WMS participants wrote, quote, we're going on this private diplomatic mission because we're not seated at the negotiating table. The organization thus operated as part of what philosophers Iris Marion Young and international legal scholar Richard Falk considered international civil society, which I think is a bit different from the way that Itty was talking about it, but we can certainly discuss that. It deliberately organized across national and geopolitical borders with the stated aim of transcending both borders and the very concept of enemy that often defined them. And some drew from ideas that had emerged from dialogues between US and Soviet women at the Nairobi peace tent, which they described as having the purpose of, quote, transforming the enemy into a friend. They opposed not only the framing of the nuclear issue by the national security state, but as Sissy Farrell had earlier put it, quote, the acquiescence of the press and a resulting passive electorate in the framing. Now, in their self-proclaimed diplomatic mode, WMS sought to have a direct influence on superpower leaders during the summits. They met with their international partners prior to those summits and sent correspondence with recommendations to both Reagan and Gorbachev, and they went to the cities where each of the summits were held. They met with ambassadors around the world, and while they were not able to get an appointment with President Reagan, they did manage to be part of a meeting with General Secretary Gorbachev at both the Geneva and Moscow summits. Importantly, they also took advantage of the private side of that diplomatic status um, to engage in anti-nuclear demonstrations at and apart from the summits, create a broad network of peace activists across national boundaries, and arguably take stronger positions on nuclear disarmament than they would have ever been able to take at the negotiating table. WMS also insisted on the need to obtain knowledge of nuclear weapons and, of course, on the damages that they had, um, had wrought. And they often would even bring in um, arms experts. Uh, they found every woman arms expert they could and brought them in um, to talk about, uh, to give them information. As Sissy put it, quote, there are numerous variations of protest and countless strategies for change, but one we must all have in common is to educate ourselves about the military issues. Okay, their approaches to law. In many ways, WMS participants had a traditional liberal understanding of international law, invoking the UN Charter and the International Court of Justice as though international law was always on their side. But they also took several approaches that I think were relatively innovative, um, and I'll emphasize a couple quickly. So WMS advocated for regional treaties creating nuclear free zones, um, such as the uh, Pelindaba Treaty that Austin Cooper talked about this morning, 
um, that created the African zone. Uh, finally, in 2009, they were pushing for it a lot earlier. I think in some ways those were precursors to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It called not only for states, but women's organizations to actually do the controlling and monitoring of the process um, in those zones. WMS also advocated for local governments to declare themselves to be nuclear-free zones as, quote, a statement of opposition to the arms buildup, nuclear industry, and uranium mining. And even while seeing the zones as having limited legal significance, they said, they insisted nevertheless that, quote, nuclear-free villages, towns, ports declared by local authorities have not only a symbolic and declarative role, but a practical impact as well. The campaign for their creation, they insisted, could be one of the factors in alerting people to the danger of the escalation of the arms race. Now, some international law scholars have played up similar local government efforts, sometimes aimed directly at undermining the state's claims about its international legal obligations or lack thereof. Karen Knopp, for instance, argued that such municipal ordinances can both create hard local law and participate in a soft international feedback cycle on treaty implementation. And of course, the ordinances provide a way for cities to participate in foreign relations. Now, this strategy had significant success with regard to nuclear-free zones. In the US alone, over 220 municipalities and Native American tribes declared themselves nuclear-free. And there's now a renewed effort that's arguably more consciously intergenerational, bringing together environmental and peace advocates um, which Hiro Miyazaki will discuss in some detail in his presentation, and which I think some of you spent lunch starting to organize around and thinking about possibly having such an ordinance uh, in Austin. So third, their capacious feminist agenda, um, which shouldn't have to be that, they didn't think of it in that way. Um, it was on gender, peace, the environment, and more. So the WMS made clear that it drew many of its ideas and organization from women's peace movement of the First World War, which organized to make recommendations for the Hague Peace Conference. WMS echoed the movement's rhetoric in many ways, including by insisting that were women in power, the world would be more peaceful. That said, many participants moved away from basing that proposition on biological essentialism particularly on conceptions of motherhood. They knew that they could not assume a common disarmament sentiment among women. They needed to convince women as well as men to support it. WMS participants often tied their arguments to gender equality, but they also saw peace as an integral part of other issues they considered feminist. And this goes back to the 70s, the early 70s even. So some of those were, um, as Sissy named them, quote, unemployment, education, the environment, civil rights, foreign policy, the arms race, and the threat of nuclear holocaust. And they believed that decreasing spending on arms would allow for addressing what uh, Marguerite Popendo, who was their actually their international spokesperson, referred to as, quote, other enemies of the world, hunger, malnutrition, disease, poverty, underdevelopment, inequality, and racism. And they attended to the effects of the nuclear arms race on many non-nuclear countries, noting the ways that research and the funds which could solve these problems, those other enemies, are now eaten up by the escalating arms race. Now, I can find little about WMS after the 1990 Gorbachev-Bush summit. The last public report I found is from a few months before the summit, acknowledging progress in the arms race, but calling for continued efforts at a comprehensive test ban treaty and much more, including the end to imperialism and third world debt. But with the end of the Cold War, the organization seems to have dissipated along with other peace and, and, and disarmament activism. By the mid 1990s, when international legal feminism started to, to, to theorize international law from feminist approaches, there were no longer, these were no longer the issues that occupied the dominant agendas of internationally active feminists. 
In fact, in a remarkably short time, the focus had shifted from interstate to interpersonal violence and specifically interpersonal violence against women. And Vasuki Nazai is called uh, so part of that dynamic conflict feminism. And I've traced that genealogy elsewhere and would be happy to discuss in the Q&A if there's interest. Okay, I'm gonna have to leap forward 40 years very quickly. Um, from the start of WMS's short life, here we are, and nearly 35 years since the Cold War, where are we on nuclear disarmament? I had some things I was gonna tell you all, but you know, um, just to say, we still repeat nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, but do so with the sentiment often of non the strategy of non-proliferation and deterrence when you hear that from officials. Both the US and Russia in the last few mo years, months, last couple of years, have participated in unwinding many of the gains made in or precipitated by the Reagan-Gorbachev summits including withdrawal from the INF Treaty, which the US did and Russia soon followed. In February, 2023, Russia announced it would suspend its obligations under the New START Treaty that had been negotiated in 2011 and had in the early days of Biden's presidency been extended until 2026. And that announcement followed several months of threats that Putin had made to use nuclear weapons to protect Russia's territorial integrity and an international law claim in its war with Ukraine. And in early November 2023, Russia withdrew from the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which the US, of course, had never ratified. Even without the threat of renewed nuclear testing and use, the Russia-Ukraine war has been devastating. Yet only a very few peace activists and international law scholars have called for a ceasefire in the war, in that war, contested or even questioned the expansion of NATO or opposed weapons transfers to Ukraine, with the possible exception of the supply of cluster bombs. Peacemaking with regard to, international, to the international conflict, especially but not only for international lawyers, has almost become taboo. And just by way of example, in May 2023, a program director at the European University Institute canceled an event titled Ukraine Type for, Time for a Compromise. Um, that was just going too far. Most international law responses have been aimed at sanctions or criminal charges, with the innovation being in the types of charges um, and the increased possible venues for eventual trials. Some cities have engaged in foreign relations by passing resolutions, though not for a ceasefire, at least not in Ukraine. Rather, much of the activity has been involved breaking off, has involved breaking off ties with Russia's sister cities, making more difficult some of the types of citizen diplomacy in which WMS was involved. So in recalling some of the work of WMS and related Cold War approaches to diplomacy, law, and gender in the context of peace and disarmament, my aim is to undo some of the active unremembering of them that began in the early 1990s. Perhaps the movement itself is partly responsible for that, accepting as many others did, the promise of the end of the Cold War and the sense that we could move on to or even back to more pressing issues. Of course, new geopolitical configurations emerged for good and bad. As Vanya just argued, though, much remained the same. Just because we turned away, of course, doesn't mean that either the threat of nuclear weapons or the toxic empire that nuclearity creates and sustains has disappeared. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we're gonna head on to our final speaker of the panel, um, who we've already gotten a little bit of an introduction to uh, throughout uh, the, the day. Uh, Hirokazu Miyazaki is Kay Davis Professor of Anthropology at Northwestern University. His research interests include sociocultural anthropology, economic anthropology, nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, the Pacific Islands, mainly Fiji, Japan, and the U.S. His current work investigates city diplomacy for nuclear disarmament, and he's going to talk a little bit about that today. Please help me welcome uh, Hiro Miyazaki. Uh, Okay. 
thank you to Juan and thank you Karen and others for inviting me here and it's been an honor to be here and this has been really such a moving experience and thank you all for being here. Um, my topic um, is uh, the role of cities in the politics of nuclear weapons and compared to many of the presentations I think it sounds a little dry and compared to my other work that focuses on the Catholic legacy of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki um, this sounds dry to me myself but somehow I'm deeply <laughs> interested in this topic and it actually even Driving, to, driving myself to be an activist. And I hope that I'll be able to convince you to be an activist in your own city, town, village. Oops. Okay, so um, ever since um, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, cities have been considered targets of nuclear attack and even um, an attack on um, nuclear silos estimated have serious consequences for residents of many major US cities. But that's not why I'm interested in cities or that's not why I think cities are important um, in the politics of nuclear weapons. Um, there are two, two, two um, um, background issues that are um, um, important to, to, to me. Um, one is, um, Cities, country cities are widely seen as actors, new actors in global politics and pol policy debates. And from climate change to migration and pandemics, city leaders and officials are actively engaged in efforts to solve these global challenges and in the context in which nation states and national governments are failing to address those issues, not only in this country, but also elsewhere. And city diplomacy, as it is known, in which city leaders, officials, and residents work across national borders with their counterparts in other countries to solve uh, transnational problems, it is currently attracting considerable attention in international relations, sociology, and other, um, other fields. And even, even the US State Department has created, in response, a new unit that is devoted to subnational diplomacy and is a new position um, created called, that is called special representative for city and state diplomacy. In the areas of security and defense, uh, such as nuclear security policy, however, cities, city leaders and citizens like us are not in a driver's seat, as you know. They are widely seen as irrelevant and their efforts are generally dismissed by security and defense experts. But um, there are many examples historically and also um, now of city um, level engagement with nuclear policy. And one of the um, uh, sources of inspiration is um, actually the, uh, um, the efforts, diplomatic efforts, long standing diplomatic efforts by the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I, as a city uh, corresp uh, peace correspondent for the city of Nagasaki, I work very, very closely with the uh, Peace Promotion Department of uh, the city government of Nagasaki. But the mayors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have long been involved in, in diplomatic efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. And each city um, has a team of officials and advisors dedicated to, to that effort. And mayors for peace at non-governmental organization, the two mayors, two, the mayors of two, these two cities founded in 1982 um, now has over 8,000 member cities worldwide, including 227 US cities, including Austin, uh, Texas, and probably the largest network of uh, cities. Likewise, um, in, uh, in the US history, uh, US city leaders and officials have been involved in efforts to promote nuclear disarmament since the 1980s, particularly. In a nuclear freeze uh, movement of the 1980s, more than 370 US cities, municipalities, um, passed resolutions calling for a uh, uh, moratorium on the nuclear arms race. In the 1980s and the 1990s, as Karen uh, mentioned, more than um, probably 200, um, uh, these numbers are kind of a little hard to um, 
confirm, but uh, municipalities declare themselves as nuclear free zones. And currently, uh, there are several city-based campaigns, uh, including the I Can Cities appeal, as uh, uh, Beatrice uh, mentioned um, yesterday. And Veterans for Peace um, also has a project called Golden Rule Project, um, and uh, which has collected numerous uh, mayoral proclamations at the, at the, at the various places uh, the, the, this boat, peace boat, uh, uh, Golden Rule visited. Visits and various um, individual uh, city resolutions also exist outside of all these uh, um, uh, campaigns. The Back from the Brain campaign is perhaps um, the most um, energetic campaign in this country. And it was originally launched by the Union of Concerned Scientists and Physicians for Social Responsibility. And it's endorsed by um, over 470 organizations and over 450 political and civic leaders, including 43 members of Congress across the United States. And campaign has established several hubs uh, for local organizing and coalition building and provides a resolution template that outlines the key elements and policy goals uh, the campaign stands for. So these are the kind of um, policy items. Uh, uh, campaign seeks global elimination and uh, the abolition of nuclear weapons, and, but also called for kind of step various uh, steps towards that goal, uh, uh, including um, the uh, renouncing uh, first use, uh, ending sole authority of the president to order a nuclear attack and, and, and hair trigger alert and cancel the current um, uh, modernization project of uh, a U.S. nuclear triad, and more than so far, more than 70 um, city councils in the U.S. have adopted back from the brink uh, resolutions, and um, these are some of the um, uh, resolutions. And the campaign um, makes available, as I said, resolution templates, but urges activists on the ground to build a broad coalition and localize the resolution temp uh, resolution. And um, one, um, these are these are kind of uh, um, endorsers and uh, endorsing cities uh, all over the country. But as you can see, uh, it's kind of um, many of them are located in the east and west coast, and um, um, in the middle and the south, um, kind of very sparse. And that's where I'm currently focusing on. Um, but not me, uh, but campaign is <laughs> focusing on. Um, and uh, so one common, um, a very easy and effective approach to localization is to calculate local contributions to the cost of nuclear weapons. And Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles, uh, actually on, the web, on its website, provides a calculator for this purpose. And you can calculate uh, the cost of uh, uh, nuclear weapons and, and, uh, and uh, each state or each, each city uh, contributes to, to the national um, expenditure uh, on nuclear weapons. As you can see, uh, um, you, if you live in Texas, you are contributing quite a bit um, to <laughs> nuclear weapons. Okay, and so that's, that's kind of quite effective um, at, uh, at, the, you know, at the very superficial level, and it kind of grabs people's attention. Oh, I actually, you know, I am part of this whole system, right? And another way to uh, localize um, uh, these resolutions, um, quite a common way, is to mention historical ties uh, the city has to the Manhattan Project. So, for example, in Chicago, where uh, I live, um, I mentioned the University of Chicago's uh, long-standing, I mean, uh, um, contribution to the Manhattan Project, and 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 also uh, Chicago uh, resolution. Also, uh, mentions uh, um, mentions the nuclear weapons and nuclear um, policy more generally as racist, and it's 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 it's, it's, it's you know, through the kind of economic reason, um, you know, with with that much money, taxpayers' money spent on nuclear weapons, we could spend you know um, that same amount of money to address uh, uh, economic disparity uh, that is often. Um, uh, mapped out on uh, racial device. And um, another um, localizing strategy is to um, 
um, ad, uh, mention, um, reference uh, the existence of uh, uh, nuclear frontline communities in, in, the, in the city boundaries. So the city of Portland um, uh, ad, 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 adopted a resolution that um, mentions both uh, uh, downwinders in, 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 in the city um, uh, or affected by um, the, um, the, the nuclear um, um, development um, at uh, Hanford site in, in the state of uh, Oregon. Um, and, and, and also there's a, a large um, community of Marshallese um, in, in the state of Oregon. And uh, so both of those uh, uh, frontline communities are mentioned in the resolution. And um, so that's the fourth one. resolution, as you can see, uh, down windows and Marshall Islanders are mentioned. Um, and then another um, interesting way to um, localize um, resolution is to uh, place um, um, signs uh, at the city boundaries. And so this is Ojai, California. Ojai is a very progressive uh, community, um, um, has um, also uh, has long declared itself as a, a nuclear free zone, uh, has placed uh, signage um, at the city boundaries, as you can see. And Ojai also um, has uh, divestment as part of the resolution. Um, uh, Ojai is not only, only um, a city that has adopted divestment along with uh, um, back from the brink uh, resolution. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin also has recently adopted uh, a resolution that has a quite uh, elaborate uh, um, divestment scheme. And currently um, uh, those people who are involved in that effort um, are working very closely with, uh, with city officials to develop a process. Um, and um, um, I think divestment is a kind of interesting way uh, uh, to localize uh, this commitment in the sense that every time something comes up, some contract, big contract comes up, involving nuclear in, uh, weapons industry, um, the city, city officials have to kind of vet, vet um, the contract. So this nuclear weapons have come to, in, in, come in, come to their mind every time a large contract uh, um, comes to their attention. And of course, they can exempt any contract for various reasons, but that kind of, uh, you know, uh, the bumps, road bumps, uh, um, uh, it creates a very effective way to conti continue to engage uh, citizens and city leaders. So for the last uh, few months, I've been uh, um, doing some in-depth research in uh, the Twin Cities uh, in, in Minnesota, probably because uh, St. Paul is um, a sister city of Nagasaki since 1955. Uh, but it's a very uh, progressive uh, city, and I uh, wanted to understand how uh, this process uh, was unfolding in, in that particular city. Um, so the key uh, organizers um, um, in that effort was individual affiliated with Rotary Club, um, and also um, um, uh, Veterans for Peace and Women Against Military Madness. And they, they approached uh, one of the um, um, city council members and then she, she almost readily uh, agreed to champion this cause, uh, but she encountered um, um, somewhat unexpected um, um, obstacle uh, in the process. So she herself had um, um, introduced another resolution a uh, couple of years before, a few years before, um, about um, 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 religious mi minorities. That was actually about, this is a response to uh, um, India's uh, uh, treatment of uh, Muslims, but uh, the resolution doesn't really name the country. Uh, but this created a huge controversy in, in the city. Um, look, there are lots of South Asian residents um, in, in, uh, um, in the Twin Cities. And then, and then so like, uh, this was passed unanimously, but subsequently there was a lot of protest. So that experience became a problem for, for a nuclear resolution. Um, sorry. Yeah, and, um, and, and, but, but, but this just, I mean, eventually the resolution was adopted unanimously, but um, we also need to kind of be mindful of the fact that there's kind of cost to resolute, uh, like adop adopting, introducing a resolution, you know, 
these resolutions really sound kind of symbolic and actually quite symbolic. You know, they don't necessarily have immediate effect on national policy, but it does it does um, cost um, council members and their legislative staff um, some time and political capital, and then it, it can it can uh, kind of uh, um, uh, cause um, problems for other things um, they do as uh, um, local politicians. Okay. Um, and um, so, so why is all this uh, local action important? Um, just to conclude. So, as um, activists campaign back from the um, camp back from the brain campaigners see, these resolutions are not meant to be uh, just a entries way into uh, state and a national, you know, congressional um, resolutions. But these are local educational tools and local organizing and coalition building tools. Um, but um, but uh, as I observe in St. Paul and other places uh, where um, I have been conducting research, uh, in many cases, um, there's little local organizing and there's little local conversation taking place alongside the adoption of a resolution. Oftentimes, a handful of campaigners just approach one or two uh, council members and then there's no, no debate or discussion. And then um, most, of the, most of the time, um, these resolutions are passed unanimously. Um, but this, is, this situation is changing because of uh, our Gaza ceasefire-related uh, resolutions. Uh, those resolutions are, are creating lots of uh, controversy everywhere. Um, and so many city council all members uh, now everywhere are reluctant to even consider um, back from the bring um, resolutions. So, um, but um, there's a kind of missed opportunity um, um, in, in many of these efforts. Uh, I, I think if you look at all these resolutions that have been adopted, it, these are interesting records, really succinct records of locally specific concerns and experiences regarding um, uh, uh, nuclear weapons. And it's actually, actually collectively, uh, those resolutions actually offer a vision of a really um, rich, uh, richer and more nuanced vision of uh, US nuclear legacy and futurity beyond the film Oppenheimer. And um, but but at the same time, I, it's really um, a shame to to see that these resolutions not really catalyzing local conversation because you know we see we kind of assume we we are we kind of here we are kind of speaking to the choir to some extent, but uh, we assume that the nuclear weapons should be eliminated and nuclear disarmament is really important, but that's 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 not necessarily something everyone is thinking about, um, and even, even progressive people. Um, and so we need to actually regenerate, re-energize re a conversation, and these resolutions should be an opportunities to just do that. Um, so I hope that the you know, sin uh, will be um, on this map very soon. And um, um, but that's just like, uh, you know, the, we've been talking about hope um, since the beginning of this conference. And I just like to kind of offer, that, that's something like I, I have written about um, since uh, um, my graduate uh, student day. Um, so I like to offer just one, one, um, one reflection on hope. And I think there's, there's this sense of urgency for nuclear abolition, and we all kind of share that. Um, but um, like in this country, particularly, the, the, the one, one of the two major nuclear weapons countries, I think we need to take time. We really need to take time to, to uh, um, discuss um, and learn about and discuss uh, this issue and talk to lots of people and create new relationships with, with, with people from all these, all these um, 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 generations. And they, um, so I just briefly mentioned, I, I meant to talk about it um, in more detail, but St. Paul is a Nagasaki sister city and there's a committee called St. Paul Nagasaki sister city committee. And they have had a really robust, long 
long-term relationship with people in Nagasaki over the last seven, uh, 70 years. And they exchange young people and then mayors kind of visit each other. Um, and from the beginning, lots of um, anti-nuclear activists and environmental activists have been involved in this committee. But the overall kind of posture of this committee is they will never get involved in politics. So they never kind of um, serve as a vehicle for anti-nuclear activism, but they do they do organize commemoration in August every year, and they have uh, given uh, the first U.S. Uh, sculpture to Nagasaki's Peace um, um, Park, and they also have created uh, um, a Japanese peace garden designed by a gardener from Nagasaki in Como Park in St. Paul. And, and um, so they, they, they have focused on really cultivating relationships, long lasting relationships, and also space, space for reflection, like space in Como Park and space in, in peace, uh, peace Park. And, and I'm not saying that Sister City, what Sister City Committee does is the way to go, but between the sense of urgency and the Sister City's committee to long range effort to create relationships and moments for reflection, to stop and, talk and think about uh, peace, um, I see kind of hope. And we, we, need to, we need to find hope in between. And I hope in, in, um, in um, um, Austin, um, and I, I think today we started a campaign uh, over lunch, and I hope uh, that this will provide you with opportunities to learn about and memorialize Texas's own nuclear legacy um, from uranium mining to, to uh, uh, Pantex uh, plants in uh, Amarillo, uh, Texas. And, 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 but also there are lots of other ways citizens um, everywhere in the U.S. is affected. And I think cities are really excellent vehicles for re like serving as um, recorders and depository of, of those memories and commitments to to a more peaceful future. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite all of our panelists down just to sit. Um, you know, I know, I know the, the hour is getting late. I want to give maybe an opportunity for each of them to answer a question, um, just because they have been patient all day waiting for their turn. So please, Eddie, Karen, Hiro, Vanya, um, and we'll kind of bundle the questions. So if you have a question for, for many or all of the panelists, please um, raise your hand and I'll take about two to three to four. All right. Abana. Thank you for a great day of soccer talking talks. Um, I enjoyed all of these talks. We keep it I think my main question is basically how do you position yourself as a scholar and maybe an activist? And I think about the conversation I had with you yesterday. You asked me, am I still working in the English space? And I was sort of like, ah, I don't know if I am. And I think that reluctance for my part comes from the fact that I'm hyper aware of trends, you know, following the work that you're doing in India or the work uh, that Vanya uh, was describing in Pakistan. I can see what's on the horizon in African countries. The more I do research, the more I'm aware of military application the less I want to be the person disclosing that and you know, sort of that boundary between being like a CIA operative, basically, um, and a researcher and policy. So I'm just curious, like, in your own careers, how do you navigate that? Um, I like this call action in Austin. It's kind of part of the issue, but I'm just curious how you, how you sort of mediated that. And like to say one thing, I really was struck by a parent's point that there's been a shift from this question of women's activism around violence against uh, activism against nuclear 
uh, weapons to interpersonal violence. That's just that I don't know, I can never buy it. When we're thinking about those generational shifts where Awesome. Great question. Yes. A question for TG in terms of uh, you mentioned the divide between the younger generation and the older that you have. And I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about like the rise of social media in particular or you know, YouTube personalities, those who almost seem to have been on uh, like reducing that information about crossing uh, the violence threshold, even if they possibly. And just by producing you know, all kinds of jargon, just two weeks ago in the agenda, I said that uh, my RB test, much uh, called the independent, you know, uh, with the modern tech technology. And like, you know, and again, like the social media, YouTube, those channels are working with them. And I'm just wondering, like, is this in any way an indication of what uh, recently used to talk about, like, you know, the masculinization of a Supposedly, the less martial races as defined by the British, and uh, you know, kind of um, jingoism, you know, supercharged without any, you know, understanding of the consequences or something like that. Question? Um, no, I don't think it's a real first question, but I was struck by Karen's uh, reflections, quick reflections on the situation in Ukraine and the difficulty of. Uh, peace organizing in the face of something that seems like uh, it's Ukraine's decision to do what it's going to do. How do we place ourselves in that? Because that is the most current and likely situation in which weapons of uh, mass destruction are being used. Okay. I have to take them all. <laughs> take them all. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Let's take them all. All right. Pazuki. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to actually, I mean, I know I'm asking if you could be on the last, but I've been thinking about it the whole day in some sense, uh, which is that you know, there's been much discussion about the humanitarian dimensions of uh, nuclear weapons development, joint energy development, and so on, and the costs of that. And of course, it, this is not the, uh, uh, those costs are not new. That these are things that people have been talking about for many decades. And so I want to go to the other artists, because what is the work of humanitarian discourse in a context where, you know, yeah, it's not, you know, like, yeah, so maybe that's what is the cost of it. And then the other question has related to the last one, which is that, you know, was prompted by a uh, discussion of Gaza. Uh, Gaza sort of running in here as well the nuclear peace of the stuff. And I was wondering whether that's also an indicator that the nuclear activism today matters or has states that are relevant only when it's linked to issues like Gaza or Ukraine. And whether otherwise, you know, whether they the, and how do we assess the symbolic politics of it when it's not linked to those issues? Austin? Yeah, my, my question has to do with um, a theme that struck me on this panel, which um, is differences, disagreements, and privileges on sort of the anti nuclear side of the fence, or on the side of the fence where folks are at least concerned with the problem of with the, the nuclear phenomenon engaged with it. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that, for example, in, in Karen and in, in these talks that, you know, disarmament can at once, well, disarmament can sometimes coincide with the goals of arms control and non-proliferation, and also it can see arms control and non-proliferation as traps, right, or as hindrances to his own goals. And I was just wondering if, if, if uh, you wanted to say a little bit more about how these different frameworks for dealing with the new nuclear phenomena and the communities that they've engendered might interact with each other going forward, right? Because I've noticed a lot of acrimony among these communities. Right? I was wondering if you could reflect on 
some of the, the movement work that you've been commenting on to think about these differences and disagreements. I was wondering if you can mind to address the trillion dollar uh, modernization, so called nuclear weapons, that the US from the Iran war has been spearheading. If I could make it down on some other topic. Exactly. Dr. Mon. All right, seeing no other hands. Uh, I'll summarize the questions a little bit. We had questions about roles as activists, scholars, uh, a reflection on uh, uh, interpersonal violence, on social media and intergenerational uh, communication, on humanitarian law and the symbolization of the nuclear through only specific conflicts, uh, as well as a reflection on uh, one of the most important conflicts or the, one of the most uh, as you were saying, the one that it seems most likely to spiral into nuclear uh, weapons use, and then a question on modernization programs and a question on the cleavages in these movements. So I want each of you to answer each one in order. Uh, no, I'm just sorry. Uh, I'd like each of you to uh, uh, pick one or pick a few that you want to reflect on, and we'll just go down the line. We'll start with you, Vanya. Okay, so to get the very last I know we are almost you know, completely dead here. And so it's a, yeah, it's, it demands a lot of us, I guess, at this hour. But I, I will start with a, with a very helpful question of positionality. I think this is the question that always kind of comes uh, to, 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 to kind of bear on, on that what we do as our work. And, and the word that, 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 that I grew up with is praxis. And praxis is still the word I want to hang on to when it comes to, you know, uh, well, south, south. Uh, uh, formations of solidarities, ways in which the colonial feminist and queer peace uh, can still matter. And, and, and to that degree, what, what he was talking about, was talking about NASA, uh, I was part of, uh, of, of these various movements that march on the streets of London. And sometimes it feels so desperate to just go around and march. And sometimes it feels as though it's just very formative. But what I've been uh, most hopeful of is to see all of these incredibly young people together with people of certain age, right, meeting perhaps for the first time on these streets and, and creating alliances, creating that what, what David was talking about when he was talking about the, the, you know, the, the possibilities of repair as being beyond the possibilities of new relations. So that to me, at, at, at the height of this, this despair as well, uh, uh, feels quite hopeful. And, and, and I would say that the symbolic politics of nuclearism boiled down in cases that I'm mostly interested in work on, 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 on the types of nuclear uh, uh, nationalism that borders on fascism, uh, particularly in modern India, right, but also in, 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 in Pakistan, that I think we'll see who knows the next, what, what is the next, you know, the transformation. But uh, 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 in the face of all that new violence, yet old violence, uh, I think that what we can uh, do is possibly try to find ways to kind of remember and remember wise, and, and that's at least my work. But that has to be communal as well. And then so, yeah, praxis again, uh, hopefully still means something. Hmm. Yeah. Um, let me start with Alina, I think that's, uh, uh, not the easiest place to start by any means, but I think maybe some. I do have a few thoughts to share there. Um, I think when I began this, my work, which is now 30 years old in terms of working on nuclear power, uh, I never saw a distinction between the research or the scholarship that I was trying to produce and the outcome which I hoped for, which is disarmament. So it took me a long time, and it's, I think, a feature of being somewhat undisciplined to realize that within the worlds I was working in, these were not considered natural connections. And um, I think I paid various prices for it along the way by being too vocal perhaps about being um, a proponent of disarmament. Uh, but I also realized that scholarship can actually act productively for people who are full-time in movements or advocates in some way in a variety of specific ways. One of them, I would say, is that um, the potential alliances that you're trying to make when you're thinking about nuclear weapons 
should never end with nuclear weapons alone. And yet to make those connections to other areas, whether it's gender, whether it's sexuality, whether it's environment, whether it's indigenous rights, is hard work. Mm. And someone has to do that work. And it's not always possible to allow people to see those connections unless you've made it possible or clarified, in a sense, what's at stake. And not always is even the question of the future, because people often in movements think in short-term ways. They're looking for immediate responses or goals or outcomes in some way. And so someone has to do that work. And I think occasionally we've been lucky enough to make those bridges, make those connections. Um, you know, uh, and I can think of various settings in which it's actually happened, sometimes serendipitously, but sometimes also because you actually thought about it. I think I've been very fortunate in one sense, which is that because I work on specifically on South Asia and on India, but I always was curious and interested about other parts of the world and what they were doing. And when I was in Southeast Asia for the last many years, um, I sort of went out looking for anti-nuclear movements that nobody knew about. And in the Philippines and in Thailand in particular, I realized that there had been movements and actions and activities and outcomes which were very successful, uh, but which were framed in non-nuclear terms. And it, I felt it was my job to kind of bring the nuclear back in to remind people that these things actually were linked and connected in some ways, and then carry the, the lessons of those movements into other places. Uh, I think that's something that we can do precisely because of the scale at which we work and you know, our ability to see different places connected in ways that local people don't always do it. And so I would say that you know, the, so much of the work of advocacy or of change is, involves patience. And when, for example, you get after many, many years, which I think very few people could have predicted, something like the TPNW coming along, I think that we have to think about what constitutes that patience. Where does it come from? How does it come? What is it embodied in and made manifest through? Of course, these become tremendously invigorating for a movement that seems stuck or not working. But I think that we sometimes forget, especially when we hear the lecture from somebody who's been successful in doing it, it sometimes you know, makes it too easy in some ways. It makes us think it's easier than it is. And I think that you know, that, that moment of saying, let's be patient, it's going to take time, and the notion of struggle is not something that happens overnight, we also become kind of, you know, truth tellers in that way to our own movements. And sometimes that annoys people, but I think that someone has to do it, and I think that's often our job. I'll just say one more thing about social media. Um, it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't really have the empirical basis to say this, other than, you know, a general sense in which Positions have become much more locked in. I would rather just say that from the beginning, since India's independence in 1947, there have been people who are adamantly opposed to nuclear weapons and all its manifestations, and those who have been absolutely proud of the fact that India had a nuclear program dating back to 1948. That didn't always mean weapons. I mean, just mentioned nuclear program, and as I think Vasuki said earlier, this is part of that modernist uh, instinct, you know, the technophilia that. Um, uh, that uh, Alvina mentioned earlier, is something that we have to take seriously as a condition that sort of manifested in and was expressed through the third world movements and the non-aligned movements and so on. It might have been mistaken in many ways as, as we begin to realize now, but what I see actually is the fact that all these tendencies being present for a very long time. And if social media is doing the bad work that you and I probably think it is, it's exacerbating something that's already there. So getting rid of social media is not going to get rid of the larger problem. That's okay. Okay. Um, those are a great set of questions. Thank you all. So I'm like, which ones will I pick? Um, maybe I'll say something about the cleavages and then something about the humanitarian work. And somebody else can solve Ukraine. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think the cleavages question is an important one, and I. But I think Austin will probably, you know, there are so many different contexts. So, you know, from even just the three, the ones we talked about, there were different contexts from the ones you talked about. So, I would just say that looking at the Women for a Meaningful Summit and the people they were working, but they weren't actually at that point thinking about non-proliferation versus abolition, right? So, I think that that cleavage today is one that not a lot of people do fully understand. And I thought it was nicely articulated in the response to the question yesterday by Beatrice. But I think um, 
and it's 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 one I want to think a lot more about. But it, it is interesting that it came up that it's it was the very activism of the TPNW that made that then right. It almost introduced that cleavage to say we've always had these problems with not or a lot of us with non-proliferation, and now let's take seriously the non-part right and have abolition. Um, but I think. Also, that it was important that the focus of WMS was really on the comprehensive test ban treaty. And I think that was a way, maybe this will be, I'll just play a segue here. I hadn't thought about it till now, but maybe that is the segue to the humanitarian in a way. So they thought you get rid of testing and then you won't have any more nuclear weapons, may or may not be true, but that was the, certainly the idea then. Um, so then the humanitarian question, actually, I think it's interesting, Eddie, in some ways, you're putting the nuclear into the humanitarian discourse would be one way, right? So people are talking about all these issues and you're saying, but why aren't you thinking about the nuclear? And I guess Basuki's question is how does the, what's, what is, what work is the humanitarian doing in the nuclear? Um, and, you know, I guess part of the point of this conference in many ways was to take seriously the doomsday clock, but also say there's a real problem in imagining that we might have the end of the world without seeing all of the ways in which the world has been, will continue to be damaged. And, and so there is sort of the need to keep repeating that. And I, and I think, you know, Betty did such a beautiful job kicking us off with that last night and and also the connection between the various movements. So we, we could have had you give it the last talk as well in that regard. You know, I mean, what we mean by humanitarian could differ, but it seems to me that um, it's not, it's also about temporality and about trying to get people out of the mindset that it's a, either we're gonna be destroyed or we're not. And that we're either gonna be destroyed by climate change or nuclear weapons, right? I mean, those, they're, we're, we're destroying by both as we move forward. Um, just briefly, uh, so those, the, all, all these uh, questions um, kind of prompt me to think of this very simple kind of observation made by many. Um, but so nuclear weapons for me stand for distrust and nuclear weapons kind of distrust at large, right? Um, in a way, and also nuclear weapons created distrust, particularly among people who, are, who have been affected by nuclear testing and and also use of nuclear weapons. Um, so, so in kind of navigating this relationship between research and advocacy, or even like disagreements, I often see among activists. I think, I think in order to eliminate nuclear weapons, ultimately what is called for is to restore trust, which is kind of almost kind of um, impossible thing to do perhaps because we don't trust each other even in our family perhaps. Um, so, um, but, but I think, so my guiding principle in this work is really to recenter everything I do in trying to kind of foster kind of trust and, and trust in terms of scientific objectivity, I still adhere to, despite the fact that the, I kind of mix research and advocacy, because that's a very important if I were to participate in advocacy work as a scholar. And, but also I like to, in my case, I, I'm responding to not only uh, people I talk to in this country, but also um, I have a commitment to um, admin bomb survivors and other peace activists who told me about, about the importance of nuclear um, abolition. Um, so I cannot, I cannot betray them. Um, so those are things I, that, that guide me in, in all aspects of my work. And I think ultimately that is leading to Someday, I will, we won't need nuclear weapons, um, and and that's kind of a long way. But uh, but I think that's that has to be the kind of guiding principle in in all, all step was was that that's 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 kind of my kind of 
probably a very naive belief and and hope. But, oh, the question on the um, uh, modernization. And actually, uh, we spoke a little bit about it at an earlier panel. Um, Ella Weber's presentation was a bit about that that move, and it's I think also related to what Hero was saying about the ways in which we are pushing back against nuclear weapons are also talking about the economic costs. Um, and that is also a, a, a through line from the women's peace movements of the, of the Cold War. They were not just thinking about um, getting rid of one thing, they were thinking about the alternative investments in uh, poverty elimination, in environmental and uh, you know, development for for people of, of all, all across the world. So I think that is a, a key through line and something that I think advocates are are particularly attuned to. And I think something that we should all be thinking about. Can I just say yeah. So I, I don't know much about the issue, but my, from my reading, what I seem to think, what I, what I seem to come across is that one of the issues with this modernization is not just the money that's spent, but the lack of expertise in training people how to build nuclear weapons in the future. Now, it seems to me that that's, shall we say, a policy problem, right? Uh, and we don't know how it's going to be solved. But it seems to me that the critical reading of that would be to ask ourselves whether that's actually a huge opportunity or whether it's something else. All right. And with that, uh, we'll conclude this panel. Thank you so much for those of you who are tough and stuck it out.